Well, good morning. So good to see you today. Stand up on your feet this morning. We're going to get started in worship today. Glad you're here joining us this morning. We are just going to sing out together. I love that video we just watched together that, of, of Psalm 63 that my lips will praise you. So that's what we're going to do this morning, all right? He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise For who could stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks its chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. up the gates so open up the gates make way before the king of kings he comes to save the god who comes to save is here to set the captives free for who gets out the lord almighty our god is the light today that we can trust you, Lord Jesus, no matter the season we're walking through, no matter what we face as we live this life out for you, Jesus, we know that you are with us and you are always faithful. So today we worship you. We lift our voices together and sing. Who could stop the Lord, oh my? Who can stop the Lord, oh my? There is no one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, we believe that. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop? 
before you. Every tongue will confess one day that Jesus, you are the Son of God, that you came and lived a perfect life in our place, Jesus, so that not just so that we could be happy, not just so that we could feel better about tomorrow, but so that we might live for you and have life that's real and true and abundant. You've invited us into the truest story there is, the most wonderful story, and that's that redemption is available to the whole world. Hope is available to the whole world, and you died so that it could be. And it's our responsibility to go and share that message. So, Jesus, today we worship you, we honor you because you are worthy. We sing because we're just reflecting on and singing back to you what you've done for us, because we are thankful, Jesus. God, we praise you today in this sanctuary. I pray that our praise wouldn't stay here, but that it would go with us as we leave later today. We love you, Lord. We just continue to sing to you now.
my bonds of sin and shame he rose you rose the grave and death are conquered you broke my bonds of sin and shame oh lord my rock and my redeemer may all my days bring glory to Most of our life is spent with just so much nervous energy. And we feel like we're not doing, being productive unless we're just moving constantly. And Father, for these moments, we need to be still. We need to know, God, that you are at work around us every day and and God, you want to do something that only you can do inside of us so that only you and you alone can get the credit for it. So that this small list of names is just a fraction of the people that is in our life today. So Father, we cry out to you on behalf of uh, the people in front of us and the people behind us and the people beside us. And and we recognize that what needs to happen, more importantly than everything else in our life today, needs to happen in us today. And Lord, do something in us that only you, oh God, can get credit for. In Christ's name. To Psalm 62, it says, I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. My salvation and glory depend on God. My strong rock, my refuge is in him. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Place no trust in oppression or false hope and robbery. If wealth increases, don't set your heart on it. God has spoken once, and I have heard this twice. Strength belongs to God, and faithful love belongs to you, Lord. God, today we praise you that you are our strong rock, our refuge, that we can run to you in every moment. There's no other safe place but you, Jesus. We might think there is. We might run there for a moment, but there's no other place but you, Jesus, that's truly safe. So today we run to you. We set our hearts, our attention, our hopes only on you today, Jesus. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. This trial and storm, what heights allow, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone. Took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save.
Still on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. Precious blood of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. No guilt in life, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Oh, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stay. Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ we stand And what a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear we set our attention on you. We lay everything before you. Show us how to follow you. Show us how to live at your feet today, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We want you to know that we've equipped you with a subscription to Right Now Media, which offers in-depth video Bible studies to help you grow in your faith. The good news of Psalm 23 is that there's goodness and mercy for the sinner, the struggler, the weary, and we're invited into the presence of God. In Right Now Media's Books of the Bible series, learn from top Bible teachers like Francis Chan, Dr. Tony Evans, Louis Giglio, Matt Chandler, and Jenny Allen. This is where the most enlightened people were, and Paul shows up with an entirely different new faith. These resources take you through entire books of the Bible, including the Gospel of Mark, 1 Corinthians, and Judges. Judges gives you a glimpse into the heart of the true God that never stops pursuing His people. We hope and pray this resource will help strengthen your relationship with God. You have free access to Right Now Media through our subscription. We'd love for you to take advantage of it. If you have not downloaded the app, you should. Um, it is not to take the place of your local church, but it's to enhance your experience of being the body of Christ. Uh, one of the greatest liberating things that ever happened to me personally as a Christian is when I realized the difference from being responsible for someone 
than being responsible to someone. Because I tell you, it's the weight of the world to feel like you're responsible for every action of every person that is in the flock of the body of Christ. That's not my job. But my job is to be responsible to you. And to help you to know that that is a mutual responsibility. We are to be responsible to each other. And that's what we want to try to help you to accomplish on the 4th and 5th or the 3rd and 4th of next month. Uh, you see that in your, uh, in your handout today that it's going to be when we have a, a leadership, a volunteer leadership training. And, and that's gonna, that retreat is going to happen on the 3rd and the 4th on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. And if you are not right now presently involved in some type of service in a small group or, or a part of a small group or would like to start a small group, then we want you to come because we want to equip you and hopefully start you on a path that's going to help you and alter everything about the trajectory of your spiritual formation. And we believe that will help you that weekend. So make plans, circle the date, make it a date on the 3rd and 4th of February. So uh, I encourage you to do that. If you'll take your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 again today. And, and I'm going to pick up where we kind of left off last week. Um, Last week I talked about one of the, the, the mission statement that we have around Cedar Grove that we had it printed on just about everything we owned at one time. We had it posted and, and uh, everywhere but the bathrooms. Now we've got a place in the bathroom to post it. And it says, uh, tells us why we exist. And that is that we exist to lead people to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And, and I, I love passion. Uh, I love enthusiasm. I think passion and enthusiasm uh, are, are something that should be together as a, as a Christian. We should be passionate about the fact that we are a Christian. And we should be enthusiastic about being a Christian. In fact, I don't think that the Christianity is supposed to be lived by dragging ourselves through it. I think that we're supposed to spend our life on our tippy toes. You know, serving God, looking for opportunities to, to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. That's part of passion, right? And, and can I tell you something? That, that, that is not something that just by osmosis that jumps off at you because you walk in the door of a room. Uh, that happens when our heart is put in a place where, where we can be passionate about the things that, that God is passionate about. We said that, that one of the reasons we exist is to lead people to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ in their community and around the world to the glory of God. I mean, everything changes when it's to the glory of God. Everything changes. When you do what you do to the glory of God, everything changes. That mundane job that you have that you think is a dead end, nothing but a rut, and that's all it is, is a grave with both ends knocked out of it, and you're in it, and you think, man, this will never change. Let me tell you something. Do it to the glory of God. It'll change. When you do whatever you do at your job, do it to the glory of God. It will change. You will change. You will see things in that job that you never dreamed you'd ever see when you do it to the glory of God. And that's the beauty of the glory of God. Last week we talked about uh, an encounter that Jesus had uh, in, in Bethany. And, and the Bible says in verse 38, while they were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed her into her home. And she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he had said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. And then Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and you are upset about many things. Everybody, if you were here last Sunday, everyone left here with no identity issues no more. Because we know we are Martha. We're Martha. All of us are Martha. To some degree, we should be Martha. We should be busy. There should be activity in our life. If there's no activity in our life, then there's a tag on our toe. And somebody's looking at us and saying, boy, they sure look natural. <laughs> Let me tell you something. That's the beauty of activity. It reminds us that we are alive. 
And God wants us to live a life of activity, right? But it's got to be coupled with balance. And that's why the story is put there. Jesus is not really chiding Martha for being Martha. He's just saying, Martha, you need what every one of us needs. You need what everybody in this house needs. You need a little bit of Mary. You need to be like Mary. In fact, what he said, he says, but the one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and this will not be taken away from her. What was the right choice of Mary? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Being willing to listen to Jesus. The three times that Mary is mentioned. Now there's another Mary that is mentioned in the scripture that, that was a, a Mary of a dark side. But the Mary of, of Bethany, the Mary of Martha and Lazarus, is the Mary that is mentioned in John twice and also in Luke once. It's, it's the Mary that came to Jesus and broke the spike nard and poured it on the head of Jesus and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped the, 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 the feet of Jesus with her own hair. And all the, everybody was filled with indignation towards Mary. And Jesus said, don't mess with this girl. What she's doing is right. She's doing the right thing. She's sitting at my feet. She's preparing me in John 12. She's preparing me for my death. But in Luke 10, she is doing the right thing. She's sitting at my feet. And can I tell you that, that one of the things that hopefully last week we walked away from is that, that we're easily distracted. We're like, we're like Martha. I, we live in a land of distractions where everything, everywhere we turn, we get distracted. If you watched Monday Night Football last week, you saw how the whole world got distracted over a football player. And then on live TV, on ESPN, they were praying on live TV. They didn't even start the game last night and, and, uh, between the Titans and whoever they were playing until they were all out in the middle of the field and they were praying. They were praying for Mr. Hamlin. They were praying for him. Let me tell you, there is a, a time that we are to be, be come together. But the reason we come together in prayer is because we realize that, that we can't be distracted by everything else. We need to focus in where it matters most. Because we are so distracted. And when things that we realize that are the most important things in our life then our, our focus gets absolutely pinpoint, doesn't it? And we find in Mary's life that unlike her sister, Mary was a woman of devotion. And that word devotion is an act of dedicating something to a cause or, or, or an enterprise or an activity. It's a fact of the state of being ardently dedicated and loyal. That's what it means to be ardently dedicated. To be dedicated so bad that no matter what anybody else does or says about what you're doing is not going to change the focus. Can I tell you that's devotion to Jesus? Because there's a thousand people standing in line to try to convince you that following after Jesus is not the right way to go. Because it's going to rob you of happiness. It's going to rob you of partying, part, being a party person. It's going to rob you of dirty jokes or dirty living or watching things that you shouldn't watch. You follow Jesus and you will be an old fuddy-putty, a stick in the mud, and nobody will want to be around you, which is absolutely not true. Because I tell you, the life of Christ changes everything when he changes us. He changes our life. But Shelton passed away uh, this past week. He was my teacher in the ninth grade. He taught civics. He passed away, and, and he was my teacher in New Hope. And I found about uh, um, Butch dying, and, and I tried to reminisce. Man, when I was in the ninth grade, I was a horrible kid. So I, I sent his wife a message, and 
And I said, I don't remember anything your husband taught me in school. I don't remember one thing he taught me in civics. I don't mean remember one thing that he, he did to me. I remember him paddling me on multiple occasions, but I don't remember anything he taught me. But I do remember after all of those years, over 40 years, right? 40 something years, 45 years ago, I was in the ninth grade. I do remember that every time I saw Butch out in public, uh, 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 he always recognized me. He always called me by name. And he always looked at me like he believed I was somebody. Can I tell you, I've never gotten over that. Because even after he knew I was a Christian, he would comment to Lori on Facebook about my faith and about how proud he was of Billy and, and all of this. And every time I saw him, he remembered me. And why did he remember? Because he saw the value in someone's life. Can I tell you that we cannot really see people the way they need to be seen until we see God the way he's worthy to be saw. We see him as a God who loves us and wants us and has a plan for us and that he will not waste our life. Then when we see the value he brings into our life, we see the value that he can bring in others' lives. That's the beauty of it. Mary was a woman of devotion. She, here is this woman in verse 39, that who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he had said. I read in our daily bread this week, this little excerpt of a poem. He said, an undivided heart, O Lord, is what we need each day. For we are prone to compromise and we are prone to wander from your way. I mean, isn't that, isn't that true? That when our heart's divided, we go everywhere, right? But when we have an undivided heart before God, when our heart is right with God and we want to stay right with God, then all the things that are out there, that, that crowd noise and, and that loud, just thunderous noises around us every day, it keeps us on the right path. I love what the scripture says in Psalms 86. Teach me, Lord. Uh, uh, teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. To fear your name. I was sitting there at the funeral home in Usher yesterday and getting ready to get up. And I was thumbing through uh, the little uh, book that was beside me on that pew. And, and I looked at that book and I saw it, it settled on Psalms 90. And, and just, just we, Sharon, has sent me a reference to Psalms 90. And, and in that verse, it says, it says, teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Or King James says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And if you read Psalms 90, this is amazing. Psalms 90 says, this is what life is like. It says, life is like a flash flood. It jumped, the water gets out of the banks overnight, and before you know it, when the rain stops, it gets back in its banks. Then he says, life is like a dream. I don't know if you're dreamers. You know, sometimes I don't feel well, I dream. Last night, I guess I didn't feel well, I dreamed. And I'm, it's a thousand wonders I'm even here to speak this day because I fell out of the bed dreaming last night. And you want, you want to know what got me out of the bed? There was a snake beside me in the bed. I dreamed and it was real. I fell out of that bed fighting a snake. And I turned on the light and man, I was going to my closet to find a shotgun that I do not have a shell to. And I was going to scare the snake. Why? I thought it was real. I thought that's, that dream was real. And you know, they, they tell us that dreams only last for a second. Or just a small amount of time. You know what the psalmist says? Life is like that. It's just a small amount of time. It only lasts for a few seconds. Life is like a dream. Life is like a flood. Life is like a blade of grass that's cut down in the summer. And the sun scorches the green grass. And the wind drives it away. And that's why he says, Lord... Because that's my life. Teach me how to number my days. 
that I might apply my heart unto your wisdom. In other words, God, I need time to be devoted to you. I need to spend time with you because time is running out with me. I need time. So today, for a few moments, I want you to think about this whole idea of values. We all value things, and we all have things that we value. We got valuables. We protect the things that are valuable to us. We make sure that we, we put them in a safe place or up high. We make sure that nobody can grab them or, 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 or get them. We make it difficult for people to get the things that we value. But have you ever thought about values? You know, the, what do you value? How do you know that you value something? Very simply, three ways. How do you spend your time? That's how you know that you have things that you value in your life. You spend time with it. Can I tell you, if your family is a value, you'll spend time with your family. I did a funeral not just a few weeks ago up here on top of that hill. And I was asking the granddaughter, and I've had this told me many, many times. It's said in there by the grandmother that he loved his grandchildren more than life itself. And I asked the granddaughter, I said, I read what your grandma said about you, that your grandpa, papa, loved you more than life itself. And she said, oh, that's amazing. I hadn't seen him in over a year, and he has never, ever shown any time and attention towards me. We're all good at death, but we're just not good at life. And it just reminded me, how can we love something that doesn't cost us time? This is how you know you value something. You put time toward it. This is how you know you value something. You put energy in it. This is how you know you value something. You put whatever the resource that you have to give toward it. You value that. That's true in family. That's true in our job. That's true in recreation. If you want to get good at something, you don't get good at it by not doing it. You value getting good at it. But today we're talking about devotion to God. How do you get good at it? It's time. It's energy, it's resource, it's all of those things that goes to help us to get good at it. Two words. First word, preparation. I mean, it's obvious that she sat at the feet of Jesus. She knew what she's going to do when Jesus showed up. Now, this is pre-resurrection of Lazarus, okay? She's just loving Jesus because Jesus is lovable. She's found something in Jesus and she likes it. And what Jesus had to say is worth listening to. And whatever I've got to do is not important enough for me to stop doing it so I can be there close to him because he's saying something. You know, that's how preparation works in our life. We prepare to encounter God. This dates me so bad and I'm almost weird to say it, but when I was a kid... On Little Willow Lane in Lowndes County, Mississippi, we had an antenna. And that antenna went up beside the house, and you had to go outside and turn it. If you're going to pick up WCBI, you had to turn it towards Columbus. If you want to get uh, 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 Channel 6 in Birmingham, you had to turn it towards Tuscaloosa. Now, we weren't the most brilliant kids in the world, but we did know the direction to Columbus. Mississippi, in the direction to Tuscaloosa. Well, in the afternoon, when we'd get off the bus, Mom would always make it clear, y'all can watch TV, but when your daddy comes home, y'all got to get busy because your daddy expects y'all to have your chores done or be doing them when he gets home. Well, we always raised the window facing the cattle gap because he had to come across the cattle gap to get home. And we'd have that window raised no matter what time of the year so we could hear daddy coming. And we'd be out there, and one of us had to be outside the window turning the antenna. And you had to hold the big old antenna, and we'd watch Tom York dialing for dollars. Y'all ever remember that? 
Boy, we'd sit there and we'd have to take turns every day who's going to hold the antenna because they'd have the afternoon movie on. And we'd be sitting there holding on to that until, until my daddy's 62 Country Squire station wagon went across the cattle gap. And he had a rock in the hub and it banged up and down. And we could hear it shooting up through that valley. And I'm telling you, we turned off the TV, let go of the antenna, and we got to work. Because daddy knew that we're supposed to be busy. Let me tell you something about that antenna. They transmitted that signal every day. But we couldn't pick it up until we tuned it in. God speaks every day. Every day God speaks. God speaks through his word. God can speak through others. God can speak through life experience. God can speak through a thousand different ways. But God speaks every day. And we don't hear God speak until we are tuned in. Until we're attentive. And we're on the frequency with God. God wants us to hear him. Preparation is God speaking to us. If you ever read the story of Methodism and the Methodist church, even though Charles and John were the, were the people that formated, uh, formulated the idea of, of the Methodist church, they give credit to their mother, Susanna Wesley. She had 21 kids. I'm going to tell you, they needed cable TV. They needed dialing for dollars or something. But... <laughs> 21, that man did not leave her alone. 21 kids. And there was nothing to occupy their time but, but mom and, and, and activities and playing. But when they would get in the room, they would, the Wesley boys talked about their mother and how their mother was to help formate, uh, formulate their spiritual passion for God. And the way Susanna did it is that every day at a certain time, she had a time that she met with God, regardless of what was going on. And this is how the boys knew Mama was meeting with God. She'd pull her apron up over her head. <laughs> and when she pulled that apron up over her head, all those kids got silent. Because they knew this is the time that Mama's talking to God. But she did it so consistent in her life. The Charles and John grew up and that all those Wesley kids grew up and they pointed back to their spiritual formation in the life and character of a mother that never wrote a book, never preached a sermon, never had a building named after her. But she was the driving force of devotion. And they saw that mother with 21 kids did not let all of her responsibilities keep her from the most important responsibility. And that's that preparation of being used by God. See, that's true. That's true in our life. When the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. I mean, listen to what he says. The psalmist says that. Be still and know that I am God. He says, and I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. God says, I will be exalted. There may be things in our life that drive us to our knees. And there may be football players that get resuscitated on live TV or something like that gets our attention. But I tell you, the Bible says, be still. You know that I am God and I will be exalted. And I will be exalted of all places amongst the heathen. He said, I will be exalted in all the earth. We be still and we know that he is God. The second word, it's not just preparation, it's expectation. I know this from the scripture. That Mary sat there at the feet of Jesus, fully ready to hear from Jesus. She didn't sit there with her hand, fingers in her ears going, uh, you know, just doing, making a noise, just to sit there. She sat there because she needed to hear from Jesus. And can I tell you? That's expectation. 
I mean, if I were to ask you, how I many of you fully walked into this room today and you said in your heart of hearts, God, I am getting up, I'm getting ready, I'm driving down to that room and I'm walking in that room with all these people that I don't know that well and I'm going to sit there and I'm going to look in the same direction they're looking at, but I fully intend to leave here different. We don't do that, do we? Oftentimes we're not, we're not expecting anything else to change in our life. Which is another day, another notch, another opportunity to sing and to see some friends. But what about sitting at the feet of Jesus? What about spending time with Jesus? See, it was intimate to her. It was personal to her. It was so personal that she realized that no matter what everybody else was doing, she was going to listen. She wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. How important is his word? Well, the Bible talks about his word being important. It's not in your notes, but I want you to listen to what Matthew 7 says. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock and the rain fell, the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded on that house. Yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and it pounded on that house, and it collapsed, and it collapsed with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like the scribes. What Jesus is saying in that Sermon on the Mount, that we can hear what God is saying. We can read it in red and white and black and white. And there's so many different commentaries about what God said. But the fact is, what is God saying to you? To you. Personally, individually, what does God say to you? He said, to you, if you want to build your house and weather the storms, and there will be storms... There will be a lot of storms. If you want to go through the storms and you want to come through the storms, then you listen to the word of mine and you're going to be like that wise builder who found himself a good, solid foundation and he built his house on a right foundation. It didn't stop the winds. It sure didn't stop the waves. And it sure didn't stop the storms. They all came. But guess what? It didn't fall because it was built on the right foundation. What is the right foundation? It's the Word of God. It's the truth of the Word of God. It's not just the Logos, which we look at this, 66 books of the Logos. You know, John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. That's the Logos. Guess what God does in the Logos? He gives us the Rhema, which is a specific word for your life. You can read the Logos. We can all read the same Logos. But the rhema is when God says something to you. And you know it's God speaking to you. And he says something powerfully to your life. That's the rhema of God. That's the beauty of that rhema. And that's why the Bible says in John 10, 7, uh, Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes to the message about Christ. That word for there, so it reminds us what is heard is the rhema of God. We hear from God and God speaks to our heart and our hearts are changed by what we have heard. Our life is changed. So he reminds us of the importance of the rhema, the word of God, specifically to our life. Hopefully when you came in today, you picked up, uh, somebody gave you a green piece of paper that looked similar to this, except green. 
All I did yesterday is I got to thinking about yesterday afternoon, what is maybe a way that would help you, to encourage you to do one week experiment if you weren't already doing it. So I kind of broke down the Bible app on our, phone, on, our, on our phone, how we separate the scripture. In fact, the, the, today's scripture was Genesis 8 and Matthew 8. If you've already read it, you know it. The flood is over. The bird came home, had a twig in his foot. You know, Noah and his family says, get off that boat. They have just witnessed the destruction of every human being that's ever lived on the planet. And God brought that to an end. And that boat hit some dry ground. And they're getting ready to get off the boat in Genesis 9. God's getting ready to throw something up there in the sky as a rainbow to remind all of us, no matter what people have done to the rainbow, we know what it's about. It's the promise of God that this earth will never be flooded like that. So if you read the scriptures for, for today, Genesis 8 or Matthew 8, and you read Matthew 8, you read, read how that Jesus healed a centurion's family and, and there was a demoniac man and how that there was a storm and Jesus stopped it. So in Matthew 8 and in Genesis 8, you can read about both of those. But what you do on the, on the, on the time of taking notes about it, just on the flip side of that, that green piece of paper or S-O-A-P soap. Write down what spoke to you in those passages. What verse or word or phrase or the whole passage. Write it down. Make an observation. Who said that? Where were they? And why did he say that? Genesis account or in the Matthew account? Application. Ask God to help you to make his truth applicable to your life. And then every day pray. Pray that God would give you the wisdom and the desire and the devotion to want to make whatever adjustments that you need to make in your life to follow Jesus. Last Sunday night I was at East Glen Nursing Home. I went by to see Iris. Iris used to be a neighbor of mine in Oliver Crossing, and she just turned 90. No children. Um, no ability to ever go home. So you know what that means. Her house has been sold. Everything that she owned was sold to, in an estate sale. There's no room at East Glen to bring your stuff. Everything that she thought was valuable, her heirloom piano, the family piano of her grandparents, gone. Gone. The car, gone. Gone. And all that she has in there is a Christmas tree that her and her husband had made together years ago before he died. Richard died. So I sat there and listened to Iris just talk about how that she never dreamed this day would ever come and that she would be taken from her home and that everything that she had owned would be given to someone else or thrown away. And all of a sudden, the things that she thought she couldn't live without, she was finally without. She's without them. And then but dropped in. And that's when Ira said, but you know, Brother Billy, they can't take God from me. God is with me. So I stood over that 90-year-old's bed and prayed for her. And as I was praying for her, she was squeezing my hand. And as I finished praying, she commenced to pray and just talking to God and reminding, said, remind Brother Billy of the things that are the most important in his life. You know, devotion is that thing we learn the hard way. When something's gone, man, I should have been more devoted to it. 
When there's a relationship that's gone sour, boy, I wouldn't have changed. It would have changed if I'd have been more devoted to it. When that kid, all they want to do is give you the middle finger, not the time of day, and you wonder to yourself, what did I do wrong? And you maybe not, didn't do anything wrong. But then the, you realize, oh, gone. I wonder if I spent more time if it had been different. Can I tell you, we can second guess ourselves all the way through this life. But there's one thing we don't have to do as a Christian. We don't ever have to wonder where Jesus wants our posture to be. He wants us to be on our feet like Martha's serving, but he wants it to come from our knees when we're at his feet worshiping him. So I challenge you, in seven days... Spend time with God. Let God spend time with your heart. Let him show you what's in his word. Fall in love with what he says. Make application of it to your life. Learn what it means to cry out to God in prayer. Not for things to be poured into your life. For, for his presence to be real in your life. And let God have his way in you. Let's pray. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me won't ever be hungry again. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. I am the bread. I am the water. I am that which satisfies your life. God speaks. In Genesis, God is speaking. Revelation ends with God speaking. And all the books in between is God is speaking. But have we made preparation to hear him? Are we setting aside times in our life to hear what God has to say? Do we want to hear what he has to say? Listen, if you don't want God, I get that. I get that. I get that if you don't want God. If you don't want to make any changes in your life to follow Jesus, I get that. I get that. But if you said, I do believe... And I do love him. Then there's no way you can get that. If you love him. And you believe in him. Then there should be time you want to spend with him. And if you don't want to spend time with him. Friend, don't confuse yourself. God don't get that either. God loves you. God's plan for you is greater than your plan for yourself. Look what you've done with your life thus far. And most of us have got a track record enough that we know the times that we've not done well with it. But look what he does. Look what he will do when we surrender our whole life just saying, Jesus, I want to hear from you. Speak to me. So for these moments of this response, of this invitation, this is the time between you and God to say, Lord, today, today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, today, I want what you want for me. I'm willing to make every change required of me to follow you. If that is your heart today, just confess that to him. Before you leave, confess it to someone else. If you've 
need to have that need to come and just kneel at this altar and, and confess it from right here. You can do it, but you can do it in the pew. But you got to realize that when you confess it, you're confessing it to a God that knows it already that you what you need. You're not telling him something you don't know. He's just waiting to hear it from you. Everything is Jesus's. Father, it is today that we worship you. We cannot worship the way we need to tomorrow, right now, because we got right now. This is that moment, Lord. This is that moment by which we awaken today to come to this place, Father, to worship you. Because God, you are a God of, that wants us to worship. And the very thing that hinders worship in our life is devotion. Our hearts are so divided. Today, God, we need an undivided life. So do to us, through us, in us, what only you, O oh God, can get credit for. In Jesus' name. You're 
You're so good. 